beginning of an interview with Frank Swick. Uh, and we are doing this interview for the Macomb County uh, RSVP of Macomb Catholic uh, Social Services. And this interview will be given to and uh, stored in the Library of Congress in uh, Washington, D.C. for future reference and historical purposes. Uh, Good morning, Frank. Good morning. Uh, my name is Butch Kopp, and I'll be the interviewer today. Our videographer will be Steve Lutz. And would you state for the record what war and branch of service you served in? Second World War, an army. And where did you serve? In Europe. Okay, in Europe. Very good. And I can call you Frank, right? All right, good. Okay. Frank, let's start at the beginning. Tell us a little bit about yourself, where you were born, where'd you grow up, where'd you go to school, and how'd you end up in the Army? Well, I was born in Detroit, on the west side, and I went to uh, St. Hedrick's School, plus uh, Niners School, Intermediate School, uh -huh. and I was drafted when I was 19. Drafted when you were 19, so you really kind of graduated, and were no. you working any place? Uh, yes, I was working for a tool company. Well, first I started working for a railroad when I was 17 because yeah. hard times and my mother was a widow, so I worked for the railroad. Then the war began and defense work was more money than the railroad. Right, but you were drafted. Yes. How'd you feel about that? Well, I feel that my country needed. I went, right. no problem. Uh, you remember your first days in the service? Huh? Where you went to for your physical? And well, uh, yeah, so I went to Fort Custer. Fort Custer. Yes, so from there, I went down to Camp Wallace, Texas. Yeah. And I think that base was put up in a dried up swamp. It was Let me back up a little bit. You were drafted. Uh, when you went down, where did you go for your indoctrination? Down in Fort Wayne? or No. It's in Detroit? Who told you you were in the Army? You could have been in the Navy. How did that? Well, uh, well, uh, see, I, I'm pretty sure I went to Fort Custer, right okay. from there to Fort Custer. That's where the physical and all that. Okay, and where was that at, Kentucky? No, in uh, Michigan. Well, Fort Custer, Michigan? Yes, okay. That's where the uh, military cemetery is. Uh, okay, okay. So uh, tell me a little bit about that. Uh, that wasn't your boot camp there, was it? No, it was uh, just an uh, induction center. Like. Oh, okay, I got you. That's what I was wanting to know. And that's where they gave us the uniform and all. They didn't give you a choice what you wanted to be in, eh? You no. Said, You're Army. No, that's what they did there. So, uh, tell us a little bit about your experience after that going to boot camp. How did you feel? You were only 19, so this is all new to yeah, you. Yeah, um, I haven't been away from home. <laughs> right. From there, I went to Camp Wallace, Texas. Uh -huh. And that's where uh, I trained. Got my training, basic training, and uh, then from there I went to Fort Meade, Maryland. Well, let me back, back up a little bit. I want to hear a little bit about that uh, training because, like I said, you're you're a young man and have been away from well, home. Well, that training, being in a hundred degree weather, ah. it wasn't very easy. And uh, we had trained. We had, we had to go down on the beach where it was good and hot. And yeah. what, what year was this? Now? This was back in '43. '43. May 43. Okay, so the war is going on. Yes, and uh, and then we, uh, that's where I got all of my training, and uh, in fact, uh, the one that exper bad experience I had is was so hot that I got heat rash on my back. Ah. It was so bad that when I took my t-shirt off, my skin came off too. This is all And uh, all they do is give you channel lotion. Yeah. And that's it. And the only way I could be comfortable is to lay a wet towel on the bed and just sleep. Wow. And, uh, and then, then there was no trees, nothing, nothing. And you go and you go on a hike in the hot sun, we used to take a small stone and put a pole of stone in our mouth to keep moisture. Oh, okay. And then one canteen of water, <laughs> that's all. So how long was boot camp? I tell you, about, about three or four months. Okay. Like and then uh, from there, they just shipped us to uh, Fort Meade, Maryland, where we got the advanced training. 
Where are you from? from a advanced training in what specialty? Just infantry or? Any, uh, any aircraft. Any aircraft? Well, uh, see, uh, when I was at Camp Wallace, Texas, they just trained us on 30 caliber water cool machine guns. They were older. Uh -huh. And then also we had the infantry pack from World War I. Yeah. And we even had the old tree rifles then. Okay. And, uh, and now we train on uh, 50 caliber water cool machine guns. Then we also train on uh, half track with a 37 millimeter and a 40 millimeter yeah. gun. So that's where you get your specific uh, armor training and stuff. Yes. And then from there, we went to Fort Meade, and then from there I went overseas. Fort Meade, what did you do at Fort Meade? We, we got uh, advanced training there, and just I think it was more or less like hot stepping stone to go overseas. Yeah, okay, yeah, it, it kind of a little holding. Yeah, we, we got a little more time off, too. Yeah, well, you were probably looking forward to that. Yeah, in basic training, you don't get much time off. No, you don't. You don't get any uh, time off at all in basic training. Well, it's... we did get a few day off. Oh, yeah, well, that was good. That was good. So, okay, how did, how did you take the news about going overseas? Did you know? I knew I was going to go sooner or later. So. Did you know which... Uh, War no. you were going to go? The, the no, it was, it, it, everything is hush-hush in hush those days. Not like it is nowadays. Did you make some buddies in boot camp and in advanced training? No, no, because you're always changing. Okay. See, I didn't go as a unit, I went as a replacement. Ah. And so, then from there we went overseas and went on the Queen Elizabeth. Very good. Oh, Tell oh. me a little bit about that experience. Oh, that, that was a 50 caliber machine gun there in the top deck there. And, no armor, nothing in it. And if a plane comes straight from us, I don't know where the heck I'd hide. I'd have to just fire. How many guys were on that ship they took over? Oh, I don't know. It's quite a few. In fact, uh, the bunks were just set up, five, like five in a row. Uh huh. And you had hardly any room to turn the row over. So how did the uh, Detroit boy feel about being on the ocean? First time I've ever seen the ocean. <laughs> what, any rough seas or anything? Or? No, no, because the, the ship was a fast ship and it zigzagged. It went by itself. No uh, zigzag to avoid submarine kind yeah, of Yeah, to submarine. Thing. The only way they could catch you is if you came right up on them. Yeah. But uh, I, I didn't like the ship because they only fed you twice a day. And in fact, this is my mess card. <laughs> Here, show the camera. That that's uh, that was your number. Uh, yeah, and that's how many times you got fed a day. And uh, the meal, I, I wasn't good, but one thing a sergeant told me before you go overseas, send a letter home, send crackers and cheese, you know, and food. He said, because the ship only fed twice a day. Well, in fact, the area, the breakfast was at 10, 15, uh -huh. and uh, take top bunk. Ah. That's my top bunk, you know. He said, because if the ship is hit, Everybody's going to run down to the doorway. Yeah. This way you could just hop back and forth ah. and drop down by the door. Very good. It was smart. Very smart. smart move. So who was left at home? How much of the family? Uh, your your parents? Or you said your mom had passed or something when you were No, my, my dad passed away when I was uh, nine years old. And, okay. And, uh, and then I, uh, I had to... Try to help. Me and my brothers, we tried to help my mother. Okay, yes. so, you, so you had your mother and brother still at home? Yes. Uh, obviously, they they were concerned. Were you the oldest? No, I, I was the third youngest. And uh, uh, we, uh, was, me and my brother, we worked in this one plant that was doing war material. And he, he got a deferment uh -huh. for the war material. And, and uh, then when it was time for me to go, I said, I'm going. You were the first one? Yeah, so I went, and uh, then later on, he said that he joined the paratroopers. Oh, man. But then he was washed out because of his hearing. Yeah. But he, but he got killed in Germany. So what were your feelings on that ship, thinking about going over to war? Uh, well, it's your young, so it's all experience to you. You didn't let it bother you too much, because you really didn't know what war That's was right. like. And, uh, so where did you guys land at? Uh, in Southampton. England? Yes, and uh, like I say, we were went to the Repo Depot, as they called it, a replacement depot. Okay. And uh, from there, 
I went to England and I came in as a replacement to the 184th uh, an aircraft battalion. Okay. And they were from Iceland. And uh, they were in Iceland because they, they were coast artillery at that time. Right. And, uh, and they thought the Germans were going to invade that. But they, they, I talked to them and they were a bunch of miserable ones. <laughs> they were so miserable being in Iceland, Reykjavik, Katlebeck, Bunker Hill, Pimple Knob. That's what they were telling me all about that. And, uh, but they were good. They were old, older men because they were drafted for the one year. Ah. And some of them were regular army. Okay. So they were, they, in fact, they, uh, we were, so the five of us came as replacements and they made fun of us that we're nothing but a bunch of punks, we're young kids. Okay. So they were that much older. In fact, one of them said that we used to do, we run out of money, so we used to drink after shaving motion. <laughs> Crazy drinking after shaving. Did you get any? I said, yeah, I'll come out. He drank it. What's the matter? You guys are nuts. Mm -hmm. Well, you got to learn to adapt. adapt. They were the type of the guys that they get paid tonight, today, get drunk tonight, and they're broke tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. So were you going to go to Iceland from Southampton? No, I, I, I bumped into, I went into uh, as a replacement when they were in England. Then oh, they, okay. they were transferred from uh, 61st Coast Artillery to 184th AAA Gun Battalion. Okay. And that's where I went in. I never seen a 90 millimeter gun. I was trained on 37 machine guns and, and uh, 35, 7 millimeter and 40 millimeter. They put me in a 90 millimeter. Well, that's the Army's way, right? I never, yeah. <laughs> I never seen a big gun like that before. Right. But that's what the, and then that's where I was, I was they were training too with, with the new guns, because they had the six inch right. guns that they have trained over there. And, and uh, we trained with them. And after that, we were, we went to uh, Lippitz Hill, that was in Waltham Cross in England, uh -huh. to defend London. In fact, we were the first American outfit to defend London. Uh -huh. and. Uh, we were shooting at the German planes then. With the anti-aircraft? Yes. And, uh, all night, I mean, uh, what, what I hated about the Germans, they, they always raided at night. Right. We want to sleep at night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, they didn't want to, you know, participate that well. It was war, so no, they no. did what worked for them. No, it didn't. Well, you know, I've never interviewed a veteran that was in artillery or anti-aircraft uh, warfare before. So tell me a little bit about that. Is it just, you know, like target practice all the time? Is that what your training is? Or? No, no, it, it wasn't, there was target practice. And also, uh, it, uh, we learned how to put the gun. And then in England, we fired. So we we got the experience right there, how to fire. And in fact, we had our, well, they had height finders first. And then came out with a radar that was like a bed spring on a trailer. Okay. Then they come along with the bushel basket. The, the one with the uh, bed spring on there wasn't very accurate, but uh, then they came along with the round radar, like a like a dish mirror. Right, right. Maybe. And that was more accurate. Okay. So you had a little advanced warning that aircraft was coming in, and you could compare oh, yes. your, all your uh, uh, yes, the, the, the gauges the, and stuff for shooting. When they come in with a squadron job, plane, jet, enemy plane, they turn on the searchlights which I think was wrong, okay. because as soon as the searchlights hit them, they dispersed. Right. If they came in, and squad them. You'd have got more of them. Easy picking. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you were over there pretty much right away and started yeah. shooting Yeah, right away. It was right away with, with maneuvers and uh, training and, and firing. And, and I was just new. And I yeah. Thought, did, did, you, uh, did you get any R&R &R there in England, like, you know, some well, of the local pubs and stuff? Yes, we did get to, uh, we got to, get to see London. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we, uh, the captain we had was a, was a nice fellow. He was really a good fellow. Yeah. yeah. We liked him. He, he was very good. So did you think uh, your, your tour of duty was going to just be in England, or were you going to go across? Uh, no, no. Then uh, what happened is they took us out of the gun emplacement, there and then we went on strict removal of maneuvers. Got to get up, go, get up, and set the gun down, pick up, and go. It was nothing but march orders to, yeah, so to learn to move in a hurry. So your yeah. job is not necessarily just sitting there shooting things. You have a lot of right. heavy duty work and loading and. Uh, yeah, but uh, 
I, I didn't have a bad job on the gun. I mean, I was a fuse setter. I had a dial in front of me that uh, the radar would come with the one bug, and I had to match the bug all the time. And it's pretty hard when you bounce into the firing. And I had a sit-down gun. Okay. I didn't mind it. I didn't have the What did they give you for ear protection? Because it's no, loud. No, none at all. That's why I... You have hearing aids? Yes. I, none. No. In fact, when we were firing in England, they, we had some old ammunition. It was so old, it was the, the brass was, was corroded. Oh. And when they fired the gun, the flash was so bad, it was like a flash bulb going off and the cracking noise from the gun would deafen you. Would guys put cotton We didn't have, no, nothing. Oh. Because when that uh, bell rang, because that was there, you had to move fast, move in a hurry. Right. And uh, you had to fire. And then before you could go to bed, you had to make sure the gun is ready to fire again. Replace all ammo and all that. On a personal level, uh, I know you've probably seen some planes you shot fall out of the no. sky. You never did? No, we never see because uh, I, I was busy watching the dial. <laughs> okay. And in fact, uh, here's uh, what uh, the records uh, that are, are playing. And the little uh, swaps, because here are planes that you shot? Yeah. Uh, see, category one is when it's, when we fired it blew up in the air. And category two is if you did cripple it and it did reach a destination. Okay. Uh, and then uh, the other one are the well, that, that'll come later. This year will come later. Okay. Bus bombs. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. So you're doing this on a daily basis, right? Uh, Just about whenever the Germans decided to bomb London. Trying to get some sleep during the day. Yes. Yes. The one thing about the captain, he, uh, he did make sure we could sleep late and he had coffee for us after we got done firing. Right. And you're eating more than just twice a day now, too, right? No, three times a day. Oh. We had a kitchen with us. We oh. had a Yeah. Yeah, we, we had a mess hall. And, uh, but there's one funny thing that happened in England uh, when we were in Lippitz Hill. The English government gave us the English shoes with hobnails on it. What is and that? Uh, they're little hobnails. They're little tacks like... Like, remember snow tires with the studs? Yeah, for like footing and... Uh... Yeah, and uh, you know, you try to run or march with, uh, with... We're not used to that. You were slipping all over. Mud and wet ground and... Yeah, and, uh, and uh, finally the captain got rid of them in a hurry. Yeah. But another joke was is we had some English so uh, and the aircraft soldiers there with us. Right. They would be training they say, tea time. The heck, tea time. We're going to keep going training and they're having tea. Right. So finally, we complained to the old man, you know, actually, about the old man, Captain. Right. And, uh, and the old man said, okay, we'll have coffee break. <laughs> yeah, if they can have tea time, you can have your coffee break. Now, see, we worked with the English there because they put the aircraft gun. Well, you're defending their country, they should help defend it too. When they fired, the whole sky was all lit up firing. So uh, tell me about your uh, camaraderie, guys you met now. Because you know these are guys that you're working with. Uh, yeah. Well, well, you probably heard that uh, that band of brothers. Band of brothers. Well, the more I thought of it, we were like a band of brothers. We were slept together and everything together, sure. and we got to know one another, and uh, we we never did get into any trouble. No arguing, no big arguments or fights or anything. Some close friends, right? Yeah, really. Any any guys from Michigan? Did you matter? And yes. Did you ever hear of Norbert Shemansky, sure. the weightlifter? Yeah. He was my buddy in the Army. You're kidding. Yes. In fact, uh, he, he joined... He was in the Olympics, wasn't he? Yeah, he won a few gold medals. Yes, in the he Olympics. did. Yeah, well, he was a good gunner because you have to ram the shells in and I tried it. I had three shells and I was done with it. He was a little bigger than he you. He was a big guy. He was, he was good. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so the, there's a few bit, but not too many. Mostly, see this... Eight and nine, the 61st Coast Guard trailer originated in Spark Sheridan. They had most of them from the Chicago area. And, uh, okay. There were some from New York, but not too much. Most of them were from uh, Illinois area. Like. So uh, on your R&R, &R, what did you think of England? Just a pretty town? or? It was all right. Uh, it was nice. It, 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 I liked London there because it was something to do, something to go around and all that. Well, when 
the Germans were coming to attack, they were going more for the cities and stuff. They weren't specifically looking for you. Did you receive any type of fire at all? Uh, no, 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 no they, they missed all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so now, now that you're doing this, where, where do you? What's happening after this now? After that, we got we went into a lot of training, uh -huh. maneuvering, pick up and go, and then, then after that we had to then the invasion started, so we had to get everything ready. The, the trucks, uh, because we were mobile, right. and uh, we had to get the gun ready for the case. Now, obviously, they didn't send you a letter to say, by the way, we're going to have an invasion in Normandy and stuff, so... No. No, you just, you were always ready. For Everything something. was hushed up. Right. In fact, uh, Eisenhower, we were supposed to go on June 5th, uh -huh. but uh, the weather was bad. Right. You no, know, but we were all waiting for us to go, but we had to wait. But you knew something was happening. Yeah, we had, oh, yeah, because it was everything... When you waterproof, and then they gave us uh, the shirts and pants that were soaked in some kind of a chemical in case they used gas. Okay. No air could get through. Wow. And uh, then they also had a shoulder patch, a yellow one, in case of that changes color, they know you use gas. Okay. And, uh, and in fact, they gave us... Uh, That's things I never knew. This is interesting. Very they gave interesting. us mattress covers, and you know what they were? Body bags. Yeah. I threw mine away. <laughs> and uh, then we just waited. Uh -huh. Then uh, when the wave went in, I think it was... You're on another ship now, right? No, we were on land. Because of the equipment, we couldn't go because we had all the heavy equipment. Okay. And, and you know what happened? In fact, the once, well, the one fellow told me, he said, if you ever have to get off the barge, make sure you unhook your belt. And because if you get land and you go in the shallow, you're going down. Right. And with all the equipment you have on, that takes you down too. A That's where we made a lot of make a mistake. And then they gave you a May West that goes around here uh -huh. with two CO2 cartridges. In case you sink, it just squeezes and it blows up. And no way will it hold you up. Not that little thing, but not with all the... You got, you got, the, you got the cartridge belt, you got bandoliers across, you got the rifle. And, uh, and if you step in water that's over your head, you're staying down. You're gone. That's why most of them drown. Right. But did the barge go across the... No, our barge, we went about 10 days later, but when the, the barge landed pretty close to shore for us, so okay. we didn't have much trouble. And see, being that, oh, and that's right, in England, they told me, uh, they said, uh, get two weeks here. I said, what for? They said, you're, you're going somewhere. I said, where am I going? They said, I don't know. They'd never tell you anywhere. Right, right. I went to demolition and learned how to use dynamite. Yeah. So, uh, I, I, know, I mean, no use for dynamite. <laughs> then, so I was on the advance party, uh -huh. and we had to go ahead of everybody and find a gun emplacement and blow up the ground so it'd be loose to dig and place the gun in right away with sandbag. Wow. So our truck was the first one. I didn't like that either. But, but did you get any news on, on the invasion before you got No, over? no, no, no. We didn't get no news, nothing. Now, when you approached the, where was it, Normandy? Yes. Could, um, could you see what the, the war had looked like and done? Yeah, Omaha Beach we landed okay. on. Okay. Yeah, but every, everything was pretty well cleared up. The roads were cleared up because yeah. as soon as we, got, we landed, we just took off. We had to yeah. go in ahead of then we found a gun and uh, we used to defend uh, the beach because of uh, any aircraft comes over. Right. But, uh, and if they did come, they didn't last too long. They took off right away. Because there was too much fire behind them. Too much firepower right there. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about this dynamite. Did you feel comfortable with that? Did it make you nervous? Uh, no. Did you, did you, well, I didn't. Uh, see, we, first thing when you went to school, they throw the dynamite to you, a half pound block. First thing you're gonna have a heart attack, you know. And actually, as long as you don't have the cap in there, it's, it's, yeah. it's no a, way to light it. Yeah, you have to have a cap and the fuse. And uh, and in fact, we always took the caps. You know, we used to, we could always lose the caps. Oh. <laughs> you're supposed to stay in the trailer, so we start putting in the truck, and that was dangerous because those caps, if, they, if it blows up in your hand, it'll blow your hand off. Wow, wow, that's the igniter, basically. Yeah, so we have to. They, they even showed us how to blow up buildings if you wanted to. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I, later on, it didn't bother us. Right. It was nothing. You know. Right. Even if you, in fact, you throw the dynamite out of the trail to one another, it didn't bother us. 
Well, that's what young guys do. They play games. And stuff. Yeah. But, uh, and if a shell, a tracer ever hit that trailer, they wouldn't even find our dog tags. <laughs> right, right. Well, well, that's that's something you know and learn, and just keep in the back of your mind. But so now here you are uh, on a gun emplacement uh, on yeah. the beach, uh, Omaha Beach. Yeah. Trying to you know shoot down any aircraft. Uh, yeah. While, while the rest of the army is still pushing yeah. forward. That's one thing they never bothered. The Germans never bothered them because of too much firing in. Right. Then from there, we went to Cherbourg, and uh, that's where uh, the, the, the seaport. So okay. we had to keep that Germans away from there, too. The, right. And uh, then from there, we tried to see being, um, in fact, uh, the GIs that were in Iceland, they called themselves, excuse the language, forgotten bastards of Iceland. They were the FBI's. Okay. <laughs> and then oh, when we went overseas, when we went to the France there, we were like a bastard outfit because whoever needed air support, that's where we went. So we right. were always continuously moving. Right. And uh, always on the convoy here and set up and pick up and go. Yeah. But you haven't been shot at yet. No, no. Never shot at. No. Okay. So, so you got a warm fuzzy inside you saying, well, this is. Yeah, well, a lot of. Uh, a lot of in fact, my son in law, uh, uh, he called me uh, at the job. We were. We were peon because we weren't in the front lines. Well, they, they just couldn't. Uh, no, you provided the service, uh, you know, to, to yeah. keep whoever you were watching or the areas safe. Uh, yeah, so then uh, we just traveled different places. Then, uh, then after that, the, the Germans started sending these bug bombs. Yeah. So uh, the planes, the and uh, the fighters used to shoot at them, you know, like the English and the Americans. But the trouble is, when you hit one, it blows up. There's so much crap, they used to knock the plane down. Okay. So we had to, being that it flew, you know, and it, uh, at what, I forgot it, in fact. Was this the, the buzz bombs that when they ran out of gas, they just dropped? They did, well, they had them set up. See, that's good. Okay. But and these are the ones they were actually shooting over to England too, right? Yes, but uh, but then they start firing them at at uh, Antwerp. Okay. Because there was a big seaport. They're the ones who were supplying the front lines with all the weapons and equipment. See, I didn't know that. Yeah, Antwerp was a big seaport. We had to defend it, and uh, we were shooting them bombs bomb down. It tells you right here how many we've been shooting down. Yeah. Okay. I got it. now. These things, they once they run out of gas, they dropped, right? Yes, yes, they did. And, uh, in fact, at night, you could hear them, and then when they quit, uh-oh. You knew it was coming down. In fact, uh, we used to fire at them day and night. Uh-huh. And uh, like if a shell first took close, they run on a gyroscope. Right. And if you fire at them, they rock. Okay. We, we, during the day, we seen something go straight up in the air. Right. And uh, at one time, in fact, I got some pictures where one buzz bomb landed so close to us. When they said hit the dirt, I was sitting there and I looked up. And I hit the dirt and it, it come down to, I don't know, a few hundred feet from us and covered the dirt and all. And it, it leaves a hole big enough. There's some pictures there which shows uh, the hole at least you could put a vehicle in a wow. So really the Germans were shooting these, not necessarily knowing exactly where they were going to shoot they, it. They knew what direction to go right. by it, but they placed the guns. In fact, this here book here would explain everything about a buzz bomb. Uh-huh. The story of Antwerp, and that's where uh, the Germans are firing yeah. these and, buzz bombs. Uh, and they used to fire them from different directions, so, the, so they had to set up these places. Uh, it's the launching sites, and in a way they put the uh, guns right there and we'd fire at them. Yeah. And if we blew them up in the air, it's all right. Because it's, it's all it says a big burst in the air, then you wait for the jump to come down. Well. So in fact, the closest I ever came one time, they were firing so many that we had to split the crew in half. Yeah. So me and my buddy were laying sort of side by side. We were about two feet away from one another. And it comes a piece of shrapnel come flying right through the tent, right in the ground. It missed us by about not even a foot. 
Wow. That was the closest one I ever had. Yeah. And the bomb, with that, that, that one buzz bomb that blew up. So uh, we, uh, it wasn't a uh, good idea shooting them. And then if you cripple them, you never know where they're going to end. Right, right. You, you, you wanted it just to explode in the sky, hopefully uh, not hit, any, hit anything important. Well, you figured the, uh, our outfit, the 184, must have, we, well, I think we shot down about 1,200 of them. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, like I said, they were firing them. And at night, you could see the fire, like a jet. Yeah. That was a jet. And then they had two big balls, about that big. It was wire. That's where they had the fuel. Okay, hold on. Let me uh, reverse this. Okay, sorry about that. That's where they had the fuel in that big ball. In fact, it, the picture shows, if you see in the picture, see the fuel is this, this ball here. Okay, I got it. That's where it was. Now you see, if you fire, that's so close, and they were they weren't very big. Were they as fast as an airplane? Or? No, no, they were. It takes here how many miles an hour they fly. I think I don't know how many miles an hour, but it says uh, 360 yeah. miles per hour. So not as fast as an airplane. No, and it's not maneuvering other than the gyroscope would. Uh, that's make why. It. Uh, that's why it was so, uh, such an easy target. Right. But they fly in a straight line. Right. And they had it figured out that. It'll fly right up to Antwerp and run out of fuel. Yeah, okay. Till we cripple them. Then, right. then they'll land anywhere. So, uh, what happens after Antwerp? Uh, now, where are you at now? Going to or Then, at Antwerp, then it comes to the, during the breakthrough. You have double bonds? Yeah. So, we got orders to move out and uh, go, to, uh, go to the town of Namur by the Meuse River and into a big stadium there. And we set up the gun because the Americans were more or less retreating and they used the bridge. Right. That's one bridge that the Germans didn't blow up. So we have to protect the bridge from being blown up. Right. First they tried the high level bombers. Right. They didn't do no good because they were shut down. And then they start to get the fighters to come down close. Then the machine gunners would get them. So we, we saved the bridge. Yeah. And that, uh, then from there we went back to fire at Bosman that were being shot toward Antwerp. Ah. And we stayed there to then uh, till the till the Hitler till he gave up okay. on that. So then we went to Germany and uh, Germany and that, that was a, then after the war was over they disbanded, they took the guns away. So you guys you, you went into Germany? Yes. Yes. Okay. We we went in fact we went all the way to Leipzig. Okay. And uh, and also, we, uh, we did go to Buchenwald camp, concentration camp there, too. Yeah. And, and uh, in Leipzig, we, uh, we got orders to move out. I said, why? He said, it was Russian territory. Oh. And that was a mistake they made in the, with the conference. They gave Russian territory too much. Too much. And then the, even the German people said for, asked us for not to you know, stick around, don't leave. And, because they, they were the wiped out were, by the Russians. Yeah, Russians were coming. Yeah. But we had to leave. From there, we went to, uh, into a German army camp and stayed there and waited. A prisoner of war camp? Or no? What's that? No, no, it was just an army tra a German army training camp. Okay. So we stayed there and uh, disarmed the Germans. We went to different places and uh, and disarmed the Germans. Uh, the American government wanted certain weapons and blueprints. Yeah. So we uh, went around helping up the guns and all that. In fact, we went to one factory where they were doing the, like a 20 millimeter shell. Yeah. Their cubicles. And I was talking to the fellow, I said, well, what about that if, uh, in the, if uh, one of these explodes and there's an accident? He said, well, we just clean up with another person in. And do you know that already they changed it to civilian use? They were already production line with civilian use. Really? That's how fast the Germans were. Wow. And one thing with the Germans, when their machinery was a little obsolete, I think, they packed it real good and set it aside where we put ours in the range. Right. That they were very good at that. Very good. The precision instruments and... Oh, they were... In fact, that German 88, that was a wonderful gun. It was a hit-and-run gun they had. Yeah. It, and then, you know, all during the war, we never seen one. I've seen one at uh, Fort Knox. Is that right? 
Nice so, weapon. So, did you see any casualties or anything while you were there? Uh, no, we were moving around too much. They, they, they most likely picked up, picked up the bodies right away, and they, they, we, we just moved too much. Yeah. Wherever they needed the, the uh, air defense, we have, were gone there. So, did you receive any medals or citations? Uh, no, the only thing we got is a Belgian fort from the Belgian government uh -huh. for defending Antwerp and the uh, town of Antwerp. Right. Well, that, that, you're very proud to receive that. And then we also received uh, these five campaign stars, the bronze star that they have. Right. <coughs> for the different campaigns you were in. Yeah. So all this time you're over, how'd you stay in touch with your family? Letters? <coughs> the V-mail. Okay. You've probably seen what the V-mail. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. about, and uh, what, what got me is, they write, you, they write you a letter, they say, uh, why don't you write more often what you're doing? We couldn't, our mail was censored, not like now, they are. Right, <laughs> TV and satellites and stuff now. Yeah. But. The, the, and in fact, uh, and you moved a lot. Yeah, and me and my brother, we, we, uh, he was in the, uh, but he landed on uh, Utah Beach, and uh, and I was already overseas when I was there, and, uh, and uh, we were gonna go AWOL. <laughs> and, and meet the like yeah. truck, and uh, I'm waiting a letter from him, and you know, you can't tell, I can't tell him where I am, and he can't tell me, but we had a way of doing it. Right. I get a letter from home, he's missing the action. Uh-oh. So, yeah, he got killed. Oh, no. I'm sorry. Yeah, and after the war was, was over. Was he infantry? Yes, he was a, a, a 94th Infantry, 302nd Division. Oh. And uh, I went to see his uh, grave, the captain uh, let me, uh, gave me three days off, and I talked to the sergeant there about the grave registration, he pulled the paper out, and he said he got his head blown off. Oh. So it must have been an artillery shell. Oh. Everybody said, how do you know? Well, that's how I found out. Yeah. Well, that, uh, that had to hurt. Yeah, uh, and, uh, yeah, two, yeah. Well, I was overseas uh, over two years. Yeah. yeah. Do you... Uh, you still keep in contact with any of the guys, or no? We had, we had a reunion every two years, but then uh, here about three years ago, they disbanded because they were old. It's too it, hard to get around. And in fact, the funny thing, first reunion I went, they said, "Here it's 9, 30, 10 o'clock." Say, "I'm going to bed." What are you going to bed for? Remember, we used to stay up all night and have a drink. Drink. He said, "Yeah, but the dog on medication." <laughs> So, so you were pretty. You were at the end of the war, didn't they? Said, okay, uh, it's time to pack up. You're going home. Do you remember that news? No, when they dropped the bomb. That's when. Over in Japan, there. Yes, that that kind of shook us up. They we're going home now. Yeah. Because we were afraid that we might go over there because they're getting ready for the invasion of Japan. Yeah. And we thought that, oh, we're going to go, you know, because all we did was sit around there for a while. Right. Didn't do nothing but. Eat and this drink is after wine. Ger this is after Germany surrendered. You're yeah, still oh yeah, it, yeah. See, most of, if you had 85 points, you went home. Right. And I had 80 points. Right. So I had to gain five points some way. So we had we had to disarm the Germans. After we got done with that, all we did was sit around, do nothing. Is that where you picked up all your souvenirs and stuff? Well, yeah, because well, I picked it up during the. In fact, uh, the way I picked up in the uh, P38 easy with. When the Germans were retreating, there was an officer that changed his clothes or something, and I picked up, hey, look at the pistol over here. Oh, yeah. That's how I was picking them up, you know, because, in fact, with Cherbourg, when they abandoned that fort in Sh uh, Cherbourg, they left everything, all kinds of equipment. Yeah. But they were afraid to touch any of that. Yeah. Because some of them were booby trapped. In fact, one of our fellows got his hand blown off, picking the hand grenade. Yeah. So, okay, so now now you're pretty much done. Uh, when did the news come that the war was over and you were going home? That was when I was in the, we were in that camp, that okay. German camp. Yeah. Now, oh, we were happy, we, we, at the being two years. <laughs> yeah, you had been away from home for a couple of years and seen enough fighting in the war. Uh, looking forward to getting home? Yeah, yes, but. 
But the worst news was that when when uh, when uh, the, when we stayed for tank and we we had in our heads we might go to Japan to right. fight. So let the other guys fight. What the yeah. Hell? Yeah. yeah, everybody everybody was doing their share, and they weren't looking forward to continuing a war, no matter what uh, front it was on. So, yeah. uh, but when they got, dropped the bomb, that's when we really celebrated. Yeah, because we knew we were going home. Huh? So you went back from Germany to England? No, uh, we went straight home. From Germany? Yes. Uh, but, you know, convoy to the seaports, you know. And, oh, yeah. And I went on the Liberty ship. And, you know, what got me is, you know, we were all combat veterans. And when we landed, there was no band. There was no hooray. No. There was nothing for us except the donuts and coffee red cross. <laughs> Those people, that, they, they had the best donuts I ever ate. Yeah. <laughs> because we didn't have any. That's right. That's right. And what what used to get done? We'd take our helmets and load our helmets up with donuts. So okay, so now you're coming back to the United States mm -hmm. and uh, they, they I, I was shocked at how fast they they uh, separation went on. Right. Real fast they on. Well they don't want to pay you no more because you're not doing nothing for them. That's that's about I tell you this, yes, right. Yeah. So, so anyways you make your way back home to Detroit? And then uh, I had a job waiting for me, and so I had a job, and then uh, then I got married. I got this shot in December, got married in February. Wait a second, Aaron. Yeah, she waited for me. Okay, she you waited. can tell me that part of the story. Yeah, I appreciate it. In fact, uh, before I went overseas, I, I bought her a little cheapy ring, because I didn't yeah. have much money. Yeah. The diamond it was, a, it was, it was smaller than a needle, I guess. <laughs> and I told, I promised her, uh, You'll come you back. Get a to bigger it. diamond. Yep. And she waited for me, so. so. I was still married, 61 years. Wow! Congratulations. So you came back. You had a job waiting for you. Mm -hmm. You found the, you know, had the woman in your dreams. And, uh, mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, now you're going to start out a life. Uh, well, the, the, the separation uh, pay that I got was 600 and some dollars. That paid for the wedding. That was a lot of money, wasn't it? Oh yeah. <laughs> Paid for the wedding, not like now. No, no. So, uh, did you have a family then? Mm, yes, we had one girl. One girl. And, uh, now I'm a great grand, great great grandfather. And a happy great grandfather. Yes, oh yes. Life is good. Did, did you did you join any organizations? Oh yes, I, I belong to the VFW. In uh -huh. fact, I, uh, later on I got a little bored. I joined the uh -huh. National Guard for a while. Oh, you did. You yeah. went into the National Guard, eh? Yes, sir. So, uh, but then. Uh, the training they give you, I, I didn't like it, so. No, so but when my time was up, I. You so, said that's it. That's it, yeah. So, well, that's that's a great history story that you told us. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add? Uh, no, you know, like I noticed that that's about, that I see on the entertainment show like US. So right, right. One time. Watch that it. was in Normandy. That's right. all we ever seen. Well, you were a busy man. We're, we're moving around too much. Sure. But uh, another thing is we uh, gave me a, we, we didn't get along with the Air Force. In fact, in, in England, we are defending the airfield and uh, there was mud, you know, we them. And we were looking at the dog on Air Force here. They got overshoes and they got side boys. What the heck's in that? <laughs> what a guy. We call them glory boys. Yeah. That was the Army Air Corps. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. At that time, it was Army Air Corps. Yeah. yeah. So they were a little uh, uppity or something, and you guys didn't get along with them, eh? No, no, we didn't. <laughs> yeah. We shoot them down. You know? That's right. You shoot them down, but uh, the enemy, of course. <laughs> so uh, how long did you work? I when worked about 62. I, 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 then I uh, got a job at Chrysler Defense. Yeah. And I stayed there. I was with them uh, for 32 years. What did you do there? I, I was a machinist then, and then I become a carpenter. Okay. And uh, that's when then Chrysler sold General the, the Defense Division to General Dynamics. Right. So did you transfer then with them? Yes, I, yes. You know, I worked with uh, General Dynamics. Yeah, I worked at Chrysler's for ten years down in Highland Park, but that's another story. <laughs> but so, anyways, you finally retired. Mm-hmm. And you're enjoying your life. You're oh, yeah, your, traveling your and all great that. Great grandchildren, you said? Yes. Wow. Yeah, I've got three of them now. Yeah. Yes, and uh, well, the only thing is I missed the reunions. You know, the, in fact, there was a little 
thing that I could add is uh, we're sitting at the table talking about the fun we had. We never right. talked about how bad luck was. Right. So this one woman said, that's what the hell you guys did. How did you win the war? Well, <laughs> because you, you, had to, you had that band of brothers. That's right. Yeah. That's, that's, really, that's what you got through. And i tell you that during the breakthrough, there's nothing. We were so cold. In fact, few of us, we used to wrap ourselves up with the tarp that we used to use to cover the gun. Right. And I swear I'll never freeze again in my life. No, no, I, I know what you mean. It was cold. Well, is there anything you want to say to the uh, people of America about your service? I, I'm honored and privileged to know you. You're, uh, you're known as the greatest generation, and I truly believe that. I've uh, read uh, Tom Brokaw's books that yes. I grew up. Did you read them? Yep. Well, he uh, he's said it like it is, and uh, you know we're uh, where we're at today because of people like yourself. And I'm honored to know you, and I want to shake your hands. Thank you. God bless you. Okay, uh, that's our interview today uh, with uh, Frank Swick. Uh, Steve, do you have any questions or anything for uh, Frank? No, I enjoyed your presentation, and uh, sounds like you had a real uh, fun time when you were out in retrospect. I. You had a fun time in retrospect when you think back at it. Oh, yeah. We, you, you, you know, if I could tell you stories about what really happened there. <laughs> it, uh, well, we don't want to know those stories, right? Some of them, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I understand. I'm a veteran myself, and there are certain stories that, that are you know, for, for veterans only. Yes, that's true. And, you know, a lot of people, in fact, if you try to, like, concentration camp, we were in Buchenwald. People do not believe what really was done. In fact, there's some pictures of here that I have. And you've know. seen it. You were there. Did you ever hear of a piggyback plane? A piggyback plane? Mm -hmm. No. Now, a lot of people don't. Take a look at it. This is, is this a German plane? Now, the Germans, they have, they see the, the bombers, the fighters could not, see the, the fighters could not, could, had carried enough fuel, but the fighter couldn't defend him if it was attacked. So they planned on putting a fighter on top of a German bomber. Yeah. And if they're attacked by fighters, they could release the fighters. Right. He was using that toward the end of the war then. But then, there's the picture, there's the proof. Well, I, I would hope someday you get those in an album. And uh, I had an album and I, I don't know, I got mad about the war. And I, I had a lot of them because I, at the reunion, I passed them out to the different fellows. This is stuff that you have to pass to your uh, great-grandchildren and, uh, you know, get it in order so that they have this history about their uh, grandfather. In fact, this is my ID card, but look what they uh, censored. See, my mother's name and address was on there, and they didn't like the Germans to get a hold of the name and address, right? So they censored it. Wow! And the censored the front and back, any address or name. So they first they issued us these here dog tags with the, my mother's name and address on there. Do you know what that notch is for? They, they say put in their teeth. That's right. But I never seen one in the dead man's dead GI's mouth. Isn't that amazing? But that's what it was yeah. for. And then, after they died, they come along, they gave us this kind of dog tag. Right, okay. That's all it. Name, serial number. Is that blood type? And, yeah, uh, blood type and religion. Right. Yep, I got my dog tags. And, uh, same that's thing. all. I lost the other one. Did you? Uh, yeah, there was two of them at the last one. But I kept my old dog ties in my pocket, so... Oh, yeah. You know what? That, that's that's part about being a band of brothers, so you you personally never forget. Well, no. anyways, that'll be the end of our interview today. Uh, you're going to get your uh, recording of it, and your history will be in the Washington, D.C. Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. God bless you, sir. You know, like uh, uh, that monument uh, they built in Washington, my, my, my wife and my daughter said, why don't you go see that monument? I said, why? Why should I see it? In fact, some people come along for donations. I said, why should I pay for a monument? 
Let GM, Chrysler, Boeing aircraft, they're the ones who made the money. Let them pay for it. I'm not going to give you nothing. You, and you're the one that already paid for it. In fact, I refused to go see it. My wife wanted to go in I said, no, I'm not going to see that dark hunt thing. Right. You know, took 60 years to do it. That's oh. right. So then uh, one time we went to uh, Atlantic City. We drove down there. So my daughter was driving. She said, I'm going to take you somewhere. She took a watch to see the monument, uh -huh. which I was glad I seen it. But yeah. but I uh, I was bitter about that. Take them too long to uh, build. That's right. Look how fast the, the all the.